this morning, we're going to be addressing a very important subject, conflict resolution. All of us, at one time or another, have been in conflict with somebody. But we must understand that as Christians, we are compelled to address the conflict and resolve it. We can't just let it go, pretend it didn't happen, or uh, be in denial about it, or it, it's going to grow and, and, and become like a forest fire. So this morning, we're going to be looking at this important matter. I hope that this message speaks to your heart and encourages you to be a minister of reconciliation. Hey, it's good to be back in Miami. We uh, we had a we had a great trip to uh, the Dominican Republic. My wife had not been back there in 20 years. Uh, we got to see friends that we had not seen for a long, long time. I had made some mission trips back, so I had been following things a little closer over the years. But it's been a few years since I've been back as well. But I got many greetings to, to send to you from my brothers and sisters in Christ from the Dominican Republic. And uh, they were asking, when are you going to bring a work team back to the Dominican Republic? So uh, out of about three different churches asking uh, for, for a team to come and help out. So uh, we have uh, uh, just a real wonderful relationship with our brothers and sisters there. The, the churches that we helped start there while we were there for 12 years as missionaries are all doing well and growing. And, and it was so much of a blessing to see what God is doing in the Dominican Republic without us being there. <laughs> and that was, uh, it was great being there and being a part of the early stage, but it's really exciting seeing what God is continuing to do with the uh, fruits of labor uh, there over those years we were in the Dominican Republic. Unfortunately, my wife got a little cold uh, on the way back. Some, uh, some, she started on Friday and it got worse yesterday. Uh, so she's under the weather this morning and she didn't want to expose any of you to that. But uh, anyway, we did have a wonderful time and thank you so much for your prayers in our absence. And I understand that, that God used uh, a good young pastor in the making uh, last week uh, in uh, Brother Joseph. Uh, we were glad to have Jack to fill in. He's the camera guy, but you got to see his face last week. And uh, we, were, uh, we were glad that he was able to, to preach. Uh, I'm anxious to see the video. I'm anxious to see that. So uh, I know you were blessed. But we're glad you're here today. And I know there's family visiting from uh, away uh, to be here for Josue's, uh, for Josue's baptism. We're, we're glad. Victor, good to have you with us as well. And the family, all of you here uh, to support Josue and his baptism today. Uh, we have a, a friend, a longtime friend, Samantha, and your family. Good to have you with us. And others here. Who are here for the first time today? Would you raise up your hand? We want to recognize all of our first-time guests. Our first time guest. Okay, we have several here. Now, Samantha's not raising her hand because she's been here before. But we're, we're, uh, we're glad that you're here. And we are happy. We hope you'll come back anytime. Okay? And, uh, well, this morning, uh, we're going to be into a subject that is very important. Belonging to God has been our theme for the year based on Romans 14 8 I hope you have memorized that verse by now and if you haven't shame on you I'm gonna help you out a little bit if we live we live for the Lord and if we die we die for the Lord so whether we live or die we belong to the Lord okay keep that verse in mind if you haven't gotten a band uh, we have these little wristbands to help us remember that, but also to uh, give us opportunities to share our testimony with others when people may ask us about the band. And um, if you would like one, see me afterwards. We'll make sure you get one, okay? All right, so this morning, we're going to be looking, though, at a subject matter, being engaged in conflict resolution. 
being engaged in conflict resolution. Now, most of us have been around or heard at least about a forest fire. Maybe some of you have actually been exposed to a forest fire. I remember going to see my mom up in Ormond Beach when she was living and living there. Occasionally, there would be a forest fire in the area and the smoke was so thick they even had to close I-95 on occasion. It was that bad. Uh, maybe some of you who are from the west, uh, west coast, you have experienced some of those disastrous uh, forest fires out there in California. Uh, we know they, they happen from time to time. But more than um, 3, 000, more than 1,000 firefighters battled a wildfire that uh, had started in the Black Hills of South Dakota some years ago. And the fire started on August 24th, and, it, and they couldn't get it under control until September 8th. Now, sometimes these fires go on like that for several weeks before they can, they can manage them and put them out. Well, there was a lady who was actually a woman who was actually involved with this particular forest fire that destroyed, listen to this, 80,000 acres of valuable timber was destroyed because of this fire. The lady, her name is Janice Stevenson. Now, I think that this is a very sad story. She was 46 years old. She was arrested on suspicion of starting the fire. She pled guilty to second degree arson, was sentenced to 25 years in the South Dakota State Penitentiary, and ordered to pay restitution in the amount of $42,240,000. $155.48. Now, that's more than one lifetime worth of work for most people, unless you're a Warren Buffett or something. But this kind of damage was done by one person that admitted guilt. When the federal investigation transpired and they found out what happened, they, she actually admitted stopping by the roadside on August 24th to light up a cigarette. She threw the match out the window and it was still lit. She saw it actually start a little tiny fire. But instead of getting out of the car and putting it out, she drove off. She chose to drive off. Now, that's an illustration because we can say, like starting a forest fire, producing a wild fire with our tongues requires little effort. Rumors, half-truths, grumblings, sarcastic remarks, hurtful things said in the heat of anger, all of these smoldering matches have the potential for burning down acres of office morale, family peace, and church unity. How frequently this has happened. Unless we are engaged in conflict management. In other words, we are engaged in putting out the fires early before they get to such a disastrous level, we can all be in serious trouble. This is why it's important for us, especially for us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, to understand the importance of being engaged in conflict resolution. Our text this morning is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning with verse 23 through verse 24. Here we're going to focus in on a passage of Scripture where Jesus is speaking in what is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And we're just going to concentrate on this one little section of, of, of Scripture, but let us do so prayerfully. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you're present in our lives. 
Thank you, Father, for giving us vision, for giving us hope, for giving us salvation in Christ. And help us, Lord, to realize the importance for all of us to be engaged in, in being managers of conflict and, and resolving conflict when the fire is little to put it out. So, Father, guide us this morning that we can get some insight and wisdom from your holy word that will encourage us in being the kind of people engaged in a ministry that Paul referred to as a ministry of reconciliation. So lead us this morning, though, as we focus in on the teaching of our Lord Jesus, that we will embrace this teaching, embody it, and implement it. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we read from, from the Word of God in Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 23. Here, the Lord Jesus is speaking. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Okay. Simple teaching, right? Clear, right? But do we do it? That's the important thing. It's not understanding the word. More importantly, it's being doers of the word. The first thing that, that struck me in this passage of scripture is that being engaged in conflict resolution must be seen as a priority. As a priority. Jesus was seeing it as a priority. So much so as to say, leave your gift at the altar. This is too important to let it go. You must. Get things resolved with your fellow man. He doesn't say it as an option, does he? He gives it as a command. Leave your gift at the altar. So, I'm going to say today, you know, if any of us, if we have ought against someone, if we're harboring bitterness, we need to get that resolved. It should be a priority for everyone who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. It should not be optional. It should not be considered optional because it's going to affect all that we're able to do in the work of the Lord. So, the second thing we must underscore here in this passage is that being engaged in conflict resolution is pivotal to having a meaningful, pleasing, and worshipful relationship with God. In other words, we can't really connect with God unless we are also connecting with our fellow men. If things aren't right with others, then we're not going to have it right with God. Okay? That's what it boils down to. Because our relationship with God is also tied up with our horizontal relationships with their fellow man. You know what really troubles me? Is that I've heard people say, Oh, well, because they did that, I'm never going to speak to them again. That kid, man, he's such a jerk. I'm never going to talk to him again for what he did to me. How many of us have heard things like that? Wait, maybe how many of us have thought like that? You know, the thing is that when we have something against somebody else, the one that it affects the most is us. It hinders our ability to have a meaningful worship experience with God. Our worship with God is, is, is not going to go anywhere, do anything, and is certainly not going to have open ears from God to accept. When we turn our fellow man off, 
Guess what? We turn God off at the same time. So, we must understand the importance. It is a priority. And it is pivotal to having a relationship with God. Now, I know this is tough. But, we must understand that the greatest of the commandments that the Lord Jesus Christ gave was in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 39, where he said, basically, the greatest of the commandments is to love God. How? With all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And then he goes on to say, and the second is like it. You need to what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so we see how important these two commandments are. Loving God and loving our fellow man. And so it's very, it's impossible really to have a meaningful, growing relationship with God and have something against our fellow man. We must reconcile with our fellow man. Now, what does that mean, to reconcile? Well, it means to bridge build, in other words. That there's a broken gulf between you and that person. And whatever the cause of it, it doesn't matter. The issue is that we need to take a step towards reconciliation. We need to become a bridge builder. We need to work at our relationships with others if we're going to have a meaningful, vertical relationship with God. The horizontal relationship with our fellow man must be right. Now, it's extremely important if we're going to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ to embrace this teaching of leaving our gift at the altar. So this morning, I would hope and pray that all of us will be challenged and encouraged to understand what Jesus is teaching us here that is so important for our relationship to be right with God. The more we harbor bitterness, the more we get angry at people that don't do things the way we should, you know, we get frustrated, don't we, when we, somebody doesn't meet our expectation? Isn't that what a definition of frustration is? Is an unmet expectation? We expect something and we don't get it. We go up and we order something and they give us something else and we lose it. I, you know, I, I've been amazed at people that get, I mean, just angry over an order that wasn't filled properly. Now, how many of us... No, I won't ask for a hand raise. <laughs> we get upset. But, guess what? We got to get over that kind of stuff. We got to be forgiving. We got to realize, hey, remember that time when we worked in that, that food store or place and we did something wrong? <laughs> we gave the person the wrong thing. And, and, and they were upset at us. We got to remember that sometimes we need to see ourselves in their position. We need to realize that, that all of us are flawed. That all of us make mistakes. That we all need to cut some slack for each other. And be willing to, to forgive. And, and honestly and openly mean that. Not just to say it, but it's got to come from the heart. It's got to be for real. It can't be pretend. You see, Jesus always looks on the heart. Remember the, the, the lady, the woman, the widow that went to the temple one day and she didn't have much money, a couple of little coins. And she went up there. Now, Jesus was observing and he saw some very wealthy people come up and put some very sizable offerings in the plate. But when this little widow got up there and gave her offering 
Jesus saw it. It was from the heart and she gave all she had. You see, it wasn't the amount that impressed Jesus. It was her heart of sacrifice that got his attention. When we are worshiping God, if we want God's attention, it's got to be from the heart. It's got to be for real. It can't be phony. It's got to be genuine. And, and this is what Jesus is talking about here is, is that our worship, if it's going to be really please God, it's got to be from the heart. And, and if something's not right with somebody, then we shouldn't fake it. We need to go and make it right with that person before we, we get into our worship position. And this is what God is, is trying to get across to us in Jesus' teaching here for us to recognize what God is looking for. He's looking for genuine worshipers who worship him with truth and in spirit. And so we must understand that sometimes we, as we remember something that is not right with somebody, we need to go and make it right. Now, there's one other point, And that is being engaged in our own conflict resolution prepares us to help others resolve their conflicts. You know, a lot of times we want to resolve other people's problems, don't we? You know, they come to us and we want to talk to them and we want to help them to resolve their conflict. But then we got something going on on the side over here. Now, we're not going to be any good for them. We're not going to be of any great help to them if we are harboring bitterness ourselves and we're trying to, to, to be a minister of reconciliation and encouraging them to resolve the conflict they have with somebody when we got our own issue that's unresolved. So to be prepared, to be engaged in the ministry that God has given to us, a ministry of reconciliation, because we've been reconciled to God, as the Apostle Paul has said in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through, through 19. As we've been reconciled to God, he has also what? Given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we are to be engaged in helping others resolve their conflict issues. And the biggest one is first and foremost with our relationship with God. Now, we, we had to start there. And so when we get it right with God, then God is going to equip us, empower us by His Spirit, humble us by His Spirit, and enable us to be the kind of, of minister of reconciliation that He wants us to be. Now, we can't do that on our own. It's under the influence and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we're able to be ministers of reconciliation. That we're able to resolve conflict. Now, it starts first with admitting that a conflict exists. A lot of people think that, you know, I don't have a problem. They're the problem. You know, so we want to point the finger. My mom always said, if you point that finger, always remember, there are three others pointing back at you. <laughs> so she, she really corrected me, you know. <laughs> so we must recognize that we're not to be pointing fingers at so much at others without recognizing all that's going on in our life. We need to recognize our own conflict. We need to own our mistakes. We need to own our sin, in other words. A lot of people try to live with sin either by ignoring it, pretending like it's not there, or just total denial. I don't have a problem. You know, it's like, I don't have a problem. But inside, they're, they're, they're in a war. And, and, and inside, they're, they're, they're not at peace. They, they don't have a, a relationship with God because they're trying to, to do it all on their own. And until we, 
we own our, our mistakes until we see our part of the problem and own that and confess it. We can't solve somebody else's problem. We got to work on our own. You know, we got enough. And we need to be focused on, on the things that are interrupting our relationship with God. Those things that are issues, sin issues that are not in agreement with God's principles and teachings. That are outside of, of God's instruction. And what he's provided us in his holy word. As our guide. As our help. As the principles by which we are to live. And when we are in harmony with God and his word and his principles and teachings, we're going to have and enjoy the peace that he wants us all to have. Actually, Jesus came as what? The prince of peace. He wants us to be in harmony with God. So he's given us that opportunity to experience that by showing us what real love is all about. And he did that best when he went to the cross. And he sacrificed his life for each of us. And when he did that, he was showing us what real true love is all about. He was showing us how to deal with conflict when people were against him. He would simply utter those words from the cross that we all remember. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, when we have that spirit, that mentality, that attitude, that mind of Christ, we are going to look at life and people and situations and conflict differently. We need to acknowledge our own conflict, not ignore it, not deny it, and ask God to help us, to forgive us. He is the only one that can provide us forgiveness of sin. And guess what? He also provides us wisdom. The book of James says if you lack wisdom, you need to ask of God. He wants to provide us that kind of help, that kind of spiritual discernment to, to have the mind of Christ, to be able to embrace his teachings and implement those teachings in our relationships with one another. And just as the Lord has forgiven us, we need also to forgive others. That is a very basic element to conflict resolution, isn't it? To be able to forgive. And that is only accomplished as we have the forgiving spirit. The love of Christ, in other words, living in us. And when we are submitting to his presence and his power in his Holy Spirit. Then he is the one who enables us to be able to forgive even under the, the worst of circumstances. But we also need to realize that God helps us through his word. So we need to search the scriptures. If we're going to have help to, to bring conflict resolution, we need it from the Lord, from his word. And so as we spend time in his word and we're searching the scriptures, God will, will speak to us and encourage us and, and, and help us to have the insight to be able to to know how to deal with various kinds of issues of conflict. I don't know of any couple that's ever been married for any length of time at all that didn't have a conflict. If you are one of those couples that has never had a conflict, you're in a very minute percentage group. Because I would dare say, if you're human, if you're human, you will have had conflict. Because two minds don't always see eye to eye on everything. We got to realize that, that our love bears all things, <laughs> endures all things, 
hopes all things. Okay? In other words, we got to realize that, that the greatest way to resolve conflict is to realize that, that our wife or our husband does not have to see it the same way I see it. Okay? And that we can actually agree to disagree and move on. Sometimes our conflict of resolution is acceptance of our differences and realizing that our differences are probably the very things that brought us together to begin with. So why are we fighting over our difference when it was actually a part of bringing us together as a husband and wife team? So conflict resolution is really very connected with God, isn't it? Because we find in the Lord, we're given eyes of wisdom, we are given a heart of love, and we're empowered with the presence of His Spirit to be able to see the value, the, the priority of coming to some conclusion in resolution of a conflict. So we can move on in our relationship and grow as a result of it. Sometimes we can actually be helped through conflict. Do you ever think about the fact that conflict can help develop our character? Can help us to re recognize the importance of humility and understand the value of forgiveness? We must realize that conflict resolution is something that is enabled by the presence of God at work in our lives. But let me say this. If you come to a place where you have been working at resolving conflict, and especially those in the marriage relationship, and you're at a stone wall, and you just haven't been able to get beyond it, then the best thing you can do is seek professional help. That's why there are men and women of God called to be professional counselors with training and guidance and help. And I would want to say and, and qualify that by saying with a spiritual life. In other words, spiritual Christian counseling may be necessary in certain kinds of situations when you have worked at and tried to bring resolution and you have not succeeded don't give up because God can help you if you're willing to be helped the problem is a lot of times people don't seek help when they really need that kind of help so that's why we're here as as ministers to share, to help and encourage. It's a ministry we've been given, but it's a ministry we've all been given. And that ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. Only God can help us to fulfill that role. It helps to understand its value, the vital part it plays in our relationship with God and the important role it has in giving our spiritual life joy and peace. God wants us to be ministers of reconciliation. He wants us first, though, to have it right with Him. So, the very first thing we need to do is recognize our sin, ask God to help us, to forgive us of our sin, to get our minds off ourselves and to put it on the Lord and, and find the help that only He can give us to be able to fulfill His purpose for our lives. I believe that God has something special for every one of us. He's got a ministry for all of us to do. And when we find that ministry and when we are using the gifts God has given us, and we're fulfilling that, that, that role of being ministers of reconciliation, 
God is, is going to do great and, and powerful things with us. So, I would like us all to be launched out of these walls this morning onto a mission field of ministry, a ministry of reconciliation. But it has to begin here in our hearts first. It has to get right with God first. May we bow in prayer. This morning, we've been talking about a very sensitive subject, I know. And one of the things that I was exposed to very early in ministry, in a little tiny church out in the country, two sisters that hadn't spoken to each other in years because they had a conflict they never resolved. It was so sad to see these two grown elderly ladies having lived most of their life in conflict, a conflict that never would be resolved. That's a forest fire. When we see conflict, let us go to it and put it out right away. That's the best way. Never sleep on it. Never go too far with it. Get to it right away as soon as possible. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to leave our gift at the altar and go and make things right with our fellow man. Father, this morning, I pray that for us to be the ministers of reconciliation you've called us to be, we know it has to begin with you, getting things right with you first. So Father, today, if there's any here who, who is not right with you, who is not really owning their sin or, or asking you to forgive them and come in and take control of their life, Lord, that you would speak to them today. And regardless of whatever kind of life they've had in the past, Lord, we know only you can make it right. Only you can wipe the slate clean. Only you can give us another chance. Only you can, can help us to put the past in the past so that we can go forward in a future, as Paul would say, forgetting what lies behind and, and straining forward towards what lies ahead. Oh, Father, help us this morning to seek your forgiveness, to ask you, Lord, to wipe it clean, that we can be right with you. But, Lord, we know, too, in having it right with you, that now you are going to help us to make it right with others that we're in conflict with. That we won't live in bitterness that can only be a fire that grows. And harms others. Father we pray. That we will. We will put fires out. That we will be ministers of reconciliation. That we will build bridges. And help people to understand the value. And the importance of having things right with you first. And then with our fellow man. So Father I pray this morning. That you would encourage us all. To understand. The value of leaving our gift at the altar and making things right with others. And then come back to worship you in truth and in spirit. So Father, today, if there are any who never trusted Jesus, never have been at peace with you, that they will discover you, Father. And that they would want you into their life to give them forgiveness and, and to come in to live in their heart to empower them to live a life of love and grace and forgiveness. And Father, for those who have drifted away from your principles and teachings, I pray, Lord, for a restoration in their hearts and minds, that they will rededicate themselves to what you want them to do, that they will embrace the vision, the calling you've given us to be ministers of reconciliation. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do as we allow you to work in us now in this invitation time, that you get the praise, Lord, for it's all about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Having heard this message on reconciliation, it, it's not just having knowledge 
about what we need to do. That's important. It's actually being a doer of the word. That's what's real key here, especially as this relates to conflict resolution. So we need to, to get proactive, be proactive in, in our relationships with others. And when that, that, that uh, little tiny spark happens that could grow into a forest fire, that we stomp on it, we get it taken care of quickly and move on. So I hope that this message has spoken to you and it will be encouragement to you as you be that minister of reconciliation that God wants you to be. God bless you, I should.